Hello, Mendocino County. Welcome to the Friday COVID-19 update with Dr. Duan. Today, we're going to start with a health officer update with Dr. Duan and then go over to Carmel Angel, CEO Carmel Angelo for a county update. And then we'll be taking questions from the media. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Duan. Good morning, Mendocino County. Um, I want to share with everyone of our county that what we're experiencing now is the beginning of the surge that uh, we do anticipate across California will be peaking in September around Labor Day. We are experiencing a surge. For those of you who follow closely the data as it evolves daily, um, to the extent that uh, we're able to post it daily, um, we've had uh, our biggest number of cases in one day, 10 cases. And I wanna speak to the fact that we're not able to post our, our data every day is because we receive the data about new cases in a variety of forms and we have to validate it before we share it. We have to, for example, contact the person, find out if they actually are even in Mendocino County. Uh, and we have a team that's been working tirelessly for, for five months now. And uh, the workload for our team has expanded with the surge. So when we have a surge, what, what happens in any place that experiences one is that the teams that have been working already have to work harder and uh, our teams are. So please know Mendocino County that um, in our DOC, our De Departmental Operations Center, our COVID response team is working uh, night and day, seven days a week. And we are uh, running as fast as we can to continue to respond to this COVID pandemic. We are in a surge, it's happening now. And we're seeing that increasing number of cases every day. In terms of the status of COVID around the world, we now have nearly 10 million COVID cases in the world and uh, nearly half a million deaths. And in the world, the United States has the most number of cases for any one country. We have 2.5 million cases in the United States and 125,000 deaths. The next country, the highest number of cases is Brazil with 1.2 million. And the third is Russia with 600,000. So US is leading in the world the number of cases uh, of COVID. But in terms of top cases by county in the United States, Los Angeles County is the number one county in terms of cases, 90,000 cases from Los Angeles County. Next is Cook County with 80, 86,000 and Queens with 64,000. So I'm sharing this with you to share that this pandemic is, uh, continues to be extraordinarily dangerous. It continues to be an evolving situation. And in California, if you've been listening to the governor's speeches, we're very, very concerned about the pandemic. We anticipate a surge that will peak in, in September and we're seeing this happening. We're seeing the, the wave mounting at this time. So I wanna reflect on the fact that um, we've had a, um, so many cases in the United States die, 125,000 deaths, and that from World War I, we had 116,000 deaths of US people. And in Vietnam, we had 58,000 deaths. So the number of deaths that we've had from COVID so far, and we even haven't gotten to our peak that we're expecting in the fall, is more than in World War I. And uh, therefore, I wanna say, Mendocino County, I wanna quote JFK from his inaugural address, from 1961, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. More and more, we need to individually ask, what can I do to, to help prevent the spread of this pandemic? What can I do to help flatten the curve? And what each individual can do is to follow the health officer orders. This includes facial coverings in public, which is also an order of the governor, it includes social distancing of six feet or more. So it's not enough to wear a facial covering in public. We also have to maintain social distancing. And if you're participating in an activity where you're heavy breathing, whether it's running, biking, anything that causes you to deep breathe, you need to be more than six feet apart. So stay socially distanced, wear facial coverings, stay home when you're sick, and there are isolation and quarantine orders. And I need Mendocino County, all of you to be familiar with these orders. These orders are the orders of the health officer to each individual person in the county. 
saying that if you test positive for COVID or are, you are a close contact of a COVID case, you must isolate if you're a case and quarantine if you're a contact. This is an order of the health officer. We've, talk, we've spoken a lot about when would we, what would we do to enforce someone not wearing a facial covering? We've talked about how someone would not be arrested for not wearing a facial covering. We are working on what the enforcement would be for facial coverings. But what I will tell you that for every jurisdiction across California, for an individual who breaks the isolation order or the quarantine order, in other words, a case who is ordered to be in isolation, which is a standing order, it's called a blanket order. So if someone tests positive for COVID, they are ordered automatically to stay home in their room with no contact with other people for 10 days from the date of the test. If that person cannot isolate in their home, the county has housing that we can provide. But if that person does not stay home, if that person decides to go out in public and break the orders, they can be arrested because this is a public health threat. We do not want people with COVID uh, out in public because that would be extremely dangerous to the public's health. Likewise, we know that COVID spreads like wildfire in households. We are seeing this all across California and we are seeing this in Mendocino County. So what we, we are aware of is that in households, if you have a COVID case, the close contacts in that household are in quarantine from 14 days of their last contact with that case. If these quarantined individuals break quarantine and decide to go out of the house, this is also a serious um, action that could be punished by being arrested. Okay, so we have not had to do that in Mendocino County. We have not had to do that. Everybody has been very cooperative for which we're extraordinarily grateful. But I do want to make our people aware that when it's asked, well, what is the, what is the penalty for violating the orders? Where we are very, very clear is isolation and quarantine orders are extraordinarily strict and you can find them on our website. And our, our communicable diseases, um, team calls every single case and calls their contacts. And if they're an, a case in isolation, they call them twice a day. If they're a quarantine, um, they, they call them once a day and they explain these things to them. So if for ex there might be a language barrier, if someone is monolingual Spanish speaking, we will make sure that one of our county team is, is bilingual and will explain in great detail what it means to be in isolation and quarantine. The, the county will also support these individuals with housing, as I mentioned, and with providing food or any other support that these individuals need while they're in isolation and quarantine. So we, I wanna thank Mendocino County for your cooperation with our isolation and quarantine orders and to just be very clear that these are strict orders, uh, blanket isolation and quarantine orders, and you should be familiar with them on our website. And, and to be clear that if you get COVID, or you're a close contact, a household member of someone who is, it is, it is automatic that you are ordered to isolate and quarantine. So for those who don't believe in this virus, um, they don't believe in the health officer orders, they don't believe in wearing masks, they don't believe in social distancing, I'm sorry, I can only say to you that you are wrong. And I don't know what more I can tell you. I can speak about science and I can speak about fact, which I do every time I speak to the county, and you are wrong. You're hurting the public and you need to uh, rethink your stance and cooperate with this pandemic because it's only gonna be through each of our individual activities that we get through this very dangerous time. The surge is happening now. We expect it to peak in, uh, in September. Now this, this surge uh, data is coming from the state. The state has a new um, website up called the California uh, COVID Testing Tools. And you can find that there's three sections to it, the now cast by county, the forecast, um, and there's another section I'm forgetting, I'm sorry, I forget the third one, uh, but I was reviewing it last night. The now cast looks at how much the uh, um, COVID is, is spreading in each county and Mendocino is not listed yet on the state website, I'm sure it will be soon. The forecast is about daily hospitalization and this forecast, uses uh, modeling tools that takes in all of the data that we report 
we report regularly our data every day to the state. And they're aware, if you wanna know how many COVID cases there are, you can look on the state websites. If you're frustrated that our, our tracker isn't updated every single day, you can look on the state, the California Department of Public Health website to see. But in Mendocino County, based on the state's modeling data, the forecast, we will have in 30 days from now, 53 hospitalized COVID patients every day in our hospital. 53 hospitalized patients per day uh, with COVID in our hospitals. This is the current forecasting by the state of California. You can look for it yourself uh, on this forecast link of the state of California. This is based on this rise that we're seeing, this rapid rise that we're seeing in Mendocino County of cases at this time, which is very, very concerning. So please uh, continue to do everything that you are doing to keep our, our county safe, stay at home to the extent possible, maintain good hygiene, wash your hands, wear facial coverings, stay six feet apart or, or greater um, if you are um, deeply breathing. And the businesses we're working with closely with West Company or ad hoc of the Board of Supervisors to make sure that the businesses are operating safely. Uh, we are seeing, why are we seeing the peak that we're seeing? Uh, we're seeing the same factors across the entire state of California that we're seeing in Mendocino County. So when we do our case investigation contact tracing, um, we uh, track why, who is the case, where did they get the infection, and we, we call their contacts to the extent that we can. It's very, very time consuming, but we take this time because it's so important to keep a handle on the outbreak. So what we're seeing uh, here in Mendocino County is consistent with what's being seen across the state. One of the things that we're seeing is that a, a, a significant proportion of our new cases are with monolingual Spanish speaking uh, people of our county, monolingual Spanish speakers. So we're aware in the county that we need to do a better job um, of getting information out to our monolingual Spanish speakers. In other words, having Spanish language um, materials and communications available to our, our Spanish speaking community. And this is something that I was on a meeting with this morning um, with our Spanish speaking leaders from our, I mean, our, excuse me, with our Latinx leaders from our county. And I'm very grateful that we're pulling together a team um, of, of individuals who are leaders in our Latinx community and uh, with our county, so we can do a better job for our monolingual Spanish speaking um, people of our county. So with our, our monolingual Spanish speakers, we're seeing that they are in different sectors of our community. They are service workers, um, they are agricultural workers, they're healthcare workers, and um, another factor is churchgoers. So uh, we are going to be focusing on these populations uh, these, these environments to make sure that we're um, giving additional information and support. The other um, issue is that we have people who are ignoring the health officer orders and don't believe in science. And for these people, they are unfortunately causing um, the spread of COVID and we're seeing this across the state. We don't know how much protests are contributing to outbreaks. Um, these protests, uh, have been small in Mendocino County, um, but in other counties, they've been larger. We do, the state does not have data about how these protests might've been impacting numbers. The other thing that we're seeing is that we are seeing um, young people being more of the people that are testing positive. In particular, we're seeing it among the teenagers. And so I will say that if you have teenagers that have been socializing, um, we need to really be careful about maintaining stable groups of um, groupings. And uh, we are going to be refining the language in the health officer orders coming out this week about these, what we call social bubbles. The governor has reached out and said that the social bubbles are not something that he wants to see um, being endorsed by counties. And so we are working on different language about stable essential activity units um, to basically bring home the point that you wanna limit the number of people that you have contact with uh, that's closer than six feet without a facial covering. And these groups need to be for at least four weeks. So if there are a group of teen friends, they need to limit their exposures to a small group of people and make sure group into larger groups and it's for four weeks at a time. So the 
the new orders that are going to be coming out this week are going to be not loosening any of the restrictions that I've created for businesses. So we are not going to have further reopening of lodging and tourism beyond what it is now. Uh, the orders are gonna hold the line where we are with our businesses. My goal and strategy is to not go backwards, which the governor may cause us to do if we have a further surge. But my goal is to hold the line where we are. So I know many people have been talking about the orders expiring on July 3rd. I'm going to be extending the orders. Uh, they're going to be coming out this week, next week, excuse me, extended for four weeks. So it'll be into the end of July and the business community will not see further opening. They're gonna, we're gonna hold the line where you are now. Uh, where I am gonna cause some further restrictions will not be on the business community at this time, but will be in these social bubbles. Um, because the governor is very concerned about them. So what we call the household support units have been stable groups of 12. I will be dropping that to stable groups of six. And when we have the stable work units, these will be dropped uh, to groups of six. I want to, to um, alert businesses to the fact that if you have a stable work group where you have people, I'm talking about people coming closer together uh, without facial coverings, without social distancing, and that whole group gets COVID, you need to have an alternate work group that you can bring in. So when you looked at your stable work groups of 12, split them in half into stable groups of six, and then you can have alternate groups in case one of your, your bubbles gets sick. Uh, we do have um, in place exemptions to quarantine only for healthcare workers. This is from the CDC. There are no exemptions to quarantine for anybody except a healthcare worker at this time, um, if there is crisis level shortage of healthcare workers. And we also do have some exemptions for disaster health workers, the ones that are on the front lines of disaster response. So in the next week, we will be fine tuning the exemptions language. Um, and it's not in the orders at this time. There is no exemptions to quarantine in the orders, but we will be uh, releasing exemptions to quarantine language this coming week, but it'll only be for those medical workers and disaster workers and those essential individuals that must continue to be on the front line in the case of a disaster. So physicians, nurses, paramedics, and disaster the disaster service workers that are, for example, in our DOC. But in our DOC, we have two teams. Half of the teams work from home, half of the teams work in the office, um, so that we can, we always with social distancing and facial coverings, so that if one team gets infected, the other one will come in and the infected team can work from home. So I know this is a lot to describe, but I'm trying to share with, with the listeners, with our county, the seriousness of where we are now as we're experiencing a surge that's getting bigger every day. With schools, I've had a lot of questions about uh, the health officer's roles in the school reopening. The health officer, uh, I am not putting restrictions on the schools. I'm not approving plans for schools to reopen. That is coming from, the guidance is coming, orders are coming from the state, but I am meeting with the schools to review their reopening plans and give them feedback. And I will be doing uh, that review process uh, in groupings so that the schools will send me their, their reopening plans um, and give me a week to review, and then I'll meet with them a week later and um, give them my feedback. So I think that's enough for my introduction. I promised uh, Sarah, my, our, our strong and brave PIO to keep this to 20 minutes. Certainly there's a lot more to say, but I will um, thank our journalists and reporters on the line to ask me the relevant questions. And I'm actually, um, to save bandwidth, going to go off video at this time, but I'm listening. Thank you, Dr. Duan. So we're going to go over to the media questions. First up, we have El Punta with Jackie Orozco. Jackie, you're live on the air, and George is also here for translation. Good morning. Um, la primera pregunta es, eh, las actividades deportivas y recreativas eh, para los niños son elementales para su salud emocion tanto física como, como mental. Los campamentos y equipos deportivos están permitidos, pero ¿qué hay acerca de actividades deportivas que se hacen 
en interiores de un edificio, uh, como por ejemplo el fútbol de salón, las clínicas de básquetbol y de, este, de voleibol y el karate. Okay, uh, sports and recreation activities for children are fundamental for their physical and mental development. Summer camps, swimming and soccer camps are allowed. But what about those indoors sports activities? For example, indoor soccer, uh, karate, uh, basketball and volleyball. Uh, what is the recommending, what are the recommendations for indoor uh, sports? So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so what we have now in the health officer orders are what we call children's bubbles. There's childcare summer camp um, bubbles and extracurricular activity bubbles. The intention with these is that you would have a stable group of 12 for a minimum of four weeks at a time. So in that bubble, that grouping of 12 can interact closely. They could play soccer with one another. They could play, a, they could practice karate with one another but only with the group, the people in that bubble. So each child can have a child care summer camp bubble and they can have an extracurricular activity bubble. So they might be in a grouping of 12, the same people for four weeks for a child care during the day. And then they could pick one activity like let's say soccer, but that soccer would have to be with the same 12 people for a minimum of four weeks at a time. So what is not allowed is for um, 12 different people to come together, children, and play soccer one day, and then get together with another group of 12 and play soccer the next day, because this would be very, very dangerous. And to remind everyone that where we're seeing a lot of outbreaks are in, in households, in household units, um, as well as in uh, gatherings that people are having in their homes um, and parties in the home. So even having a grouping of people in your home and maybe playing soccer in your backyard uh, that's not a stable group is dangerous. Okay. Eh, lo que nosotros este, eh, recomendamos y está en la ordenanza es que eh, la idea es que eh, 12 niños eh, pueden practicar deportes, pero esos 12 niños tienen que ser constantes. A eso le podríamos llamar como una especie de burbuja de estos 12 niños y, y, y constantes mencionamos que tienen que, que, que estar eh, las mismas personas, las mismas 12 personas al, por cuatro semanas. Eh, ellos pueden practicar cualquier deporte, ya sea eh, dentro de los uh, uh, fútbol de salón o fuera en el, al aire libre, eh, eh, hacer actividades eh, extracurriculares, eh, cualquier actividad, pero siempre permaneciendo los mismos 12 personas, los 12 niños que comparten por al menos cuatro semanas. Recordemos que estamos teniendo brotes, estamos teniendo brotes este, y, 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 y pueden ser estos productos incluso de eh, algunas actividades que están haciendo dentro de las casas, como fiestas o reuniones. Entonces tenemos que tener mucho cuidado si es que nosotros queremos romper esa burbuja y tra tratar de integrar a otro niño o a otra persona que no ha estado en este grupo inicial de 12 personas y por cuatro semanas de manera constante. O sea, lo, que, lo que buscamos es que haya eh, eh, constancia en las mismas personas, que a eso le llamaríamos nosotros una burbuja eh, que, que daría mayor seguridad eh, y, y eliminaría la posibilidad de poder transmitir el virus a otras personas. Ok. Uh, mi segunda pregunta, bueno, no es tanto pregunta, pero uh, es que más de los 50 casos de COVID-19 en el condado de Mendocino son latinos. Uh, ¿La doctora Luján tiene algún mensaje para la comunidad latina? Sé que Public Health se encarga de la salud de todos, pero en este caso estamos viendo más afluencia de, de personas latinas y en este caso monolingües. Okay, more than 50% of the COVID-19 cases in Mendocino County are Latinos. Uh, Dr. Duhan, do you have a message for, for the Latino community? Yes, my, in, my message to the, the Latino community is I care about you and you are a priority. Um, and I wanna thank um, Jackie and George for the work that you're doing 
to communicate uh, with our Latino community and to, to pledge that we will do more. So we are, we're asking for um, leadership from the Latinx community to help us um, to, to respond uh, to our, our um, in particular, our monolingual Spanish speaking community. This is the, the population that I'm most concerned about right now because I do not believe we're doing enough to, to uh, communicate. So we had a meeting this morning at seven in the morning and we're gonna be meeting again throughout next week to make a plan with our community leaders um, from the Latinx community and with our county workers to how we can do a better job. The better job is going to be involving better communication, better outreach. And also uh, I would like to work with community partners so that when we do our case investigation contact tracing, we can have more Spanish speakers trained um, in order to reach out to those people who do test positive for COVID-19 in their households. And then we always continue to provide free housing for isolation and quarantine so that when we do have cases, they can uh, have housing where they can safely isolate away from their family if that is something that is needed. So my, my answer is, uh, this is a top priority and we will continue to work harder and do more uh, to, to meet, um, to, to do our job, to do what is needed to, to support our Spanish speaking community and all of our community. Okay. Uh, la, la, la doctora lo que ella dice que o sea, sí le importa mucho lo que está pasando en el condado y, y, y a su vez también cómo esto, cómo la pandemia está impactando en la comunidad latina. Ella eh, está eh, tratando de uh, establecer eh, ciertas alianzas con algunas organizaciones latinas. Esta mañana tuvo una reunión a las 7 de la mañana y va a continuar teniendo reuniones porque quiere identificar a algunos líderes claves que les, que les que ayude al condado a poder eh, canalizar una comunicación mucho más uh, fluida con la comunidad latina. Eh, eh, asimismo también acá en el condado estamos tratando de que los, uh, la, las personas eh, hispanas y, y que son bilingües eh, puedan también incorporarse en, en este ejército y tratar de ayudar eh, y, y eh, también con algunas otras eh, organizaciones en la comunidad este, para poder uh, incrementar nuestra capacidad eh, en términos de personas que puedan ayudarnos a hacer investigación de caso o personas que nos puedan ayudar a hacer el seguimiento de los, de los contactos. Asimismo, el condado está proveyendo eh, a, los, a, la, a los que resultan positivos, está proveyendo la posibilidad de que ellos puedan alojarse eh, en un hotel eh, eh, por el periodo que ellos estarían necesitando ser aislados. Eh, eh, o sea, la, la prioridad está allí. Eh, somos eh, o sea, la, 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 el condado y, y, y la doctora Luján en particular considera que esto es una prioridad fundamental que ella está tratando de trabajar duro y está tratando de hacer lo más que está a su alcance para hacer es, un buen trabajo orientado eh, a la comunidad latina, pero también a la comunidad en general. And I'd like to make a follow-up comment. Um, I, I, every evidence that I have is that our Latino population, our, our Spanish speaking population is doing everything to follow the orders. Uh, our experience in the public health is that this, this group of people has been very cooperative and are doing everything they can to slow the spread and flatten the curve. So I do not believe that we're seeing an increase in numbers of cases in this population because of something this population is doing wrong. It, I think we have issues around our need to better communicate in the Spanish language and also the nature of the work. Um, and we need to do like, for example, in agricultural workers, we know there have been outbreaks across the country, uh, the state. So we need to do a better job of supporting um, both on the business community and the worker side. So I wanna be very, very clear. We are not putting any blame on the population. We are pledging to do more to help. Okay, la doctora agrega también de que ella no considera que que esta, esta cantidad de casos que están habiendo dentro de la comunidad latina se deba a que nosotros no estamos haciendo las cosas bien. No creo que sea eso, sino que eh, eh, es natura, la naturaleza, en las circunstancias en las cuales de repente nosotros estamos, el tipo de trabajo que realizamos, que, que es, es un trabajo esencial y estamos en, en, el, en el campo, estamos en diferentes lugares que de repente nos pone en una situación un poco más de riesgo. 
pero la idea es poder nosotros es ofrecer todas las uh, herramientas que tenemos aquí para poder eh, brindárselas a la comunidad donde ellos est estén y poder hacer un mejor trabajo eh, tratando de controlar la pandemia en el condado. Okay. Gracias, George. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Next up, we have Matt with KMUD. Hey guys, thanks for hosting today's press conference. Um, Dr. Duhan, uh, my first question for you today um, it has to do with uh, assertions. You know, I've seen via social media, um, maybe some clarification you can provide from an epidemiological science-based perspective. Basically, you know, I've seen assertion, uh, assertions that as cases increase and um, governments are contemplating returning to stricter shelter-in-place protocols, there have been these arguments that the spread of the virus is unavoidable amongst our population. And this leads to suggestions that herd immunity is really the most realistic method of dealing with the pandemic. We're, we're because of the reality we're forced into this. Um, can you speak to this? Is this, is this misinformation? Is there part of this assertion that's correct that public health epidemiology needs to consider um, I, I would really love for you to kind of speak to the facts and myths associated with those ideas. Well, I think the, the most important point in response is that we must slow the spread and flatten the curve. So yes, ultimately what we need to have is herd immunity. Hopefully we will have a vaccine, but short of having a vaccine, um, herd immunity is what we need to depend on. But if we have all of the cases happen all at once, we will uh, not be able to respond um, like what we've seen in New York, right, and around the world. So right now, I'd say we're seeing a small, what we would call a small surge. I mean, we've gone from about 35 cases to something in the 70s in a short period of time. Um, in Sonoma County, they had 50 cases in one day last week, or this week, actually. So you know, one, some might say it was a small surge to go uh, have about, you know, 35 cases in a week. When you look at Sonoma having 50 cases in a day, but for our county, that is a, that is a large number for us to respond to. And it's, it stretches us very thin when we have so many cases all at once, because of course, every case has all of their contacts. And one of our, our greatest weapons against this disease is to control the spread, to isolate cases and, and their contacts. So my response would be, Yes, it's true that ultimately herd immunity is what we need to achieve, but we need to slow the spread and flatten the curve in order to be able to come out of this pandemic with our economy intact and with um, protections for um, our people in place. So I, is, I, is that a, a sufficient response? Does that answer your question? Absolutely, Dr. Duhan. There's a lot of pieces of that one. So thank you for addressing it. Um, the next question, to me, it's, it's about metrics. Um, I, I think transparency about the calculus, public health officials, um, and the metrics they're utilizing in that calculus to determine when a shelter in place needs to be returned to, more stricter protocols need to be returned to. Transparency about those metrics, I think, is important. And I, I'm wondering, you know, what are the most important metrics that are being utilized to determine if slash when Mendocino County should consider shutting down? Um, you mentioned models predicting 53 hospitalizations per day. Um, would that overwhelm our current medical infrastructure capacity and force us back into stricter um, protocols? Um, so really it's a question about metrics and what metrics are being utilized to guide that decision to become stricter again. Yes, so regarding the metric, um, I, I got this metric of about 50 hospitalization, or let me put it this way, 50 people hospitalized each day um, with COVID-19 in a month in Mendocino County. This metric comes right off of the state uh, state website, the state COVID website. So I that that's a projection based on modeling that based on what we're seeing in terms of the number of new cases every day, that in our county, in 30 days, we would anticipate having 50 patients 
a day in the hospital at any one day. Uh, that would not overwhelm our current hospital capacity. And our CEO, Carmel Angelo, uh, did tell me that Jason Wells, the, the, uh, the president of Adventist uh, Health Medicino, will be joining us next week on our, our live stream, I believe. And we really welcome that because the hospital has done a, a great job to prepare um, and that would not overwhelm us, but uh, to that 50 a day. But this is early in the surge in a month. We're expecting the peak to be in September. So the question will be, can we hold at that 50 hospitalizations a day uh, or will we have a rapid rise? So all these things we're doing to uh, slow the spread and flatten the curve helps us to not surge beyond what the hospital would be able, the hospitals would be able to accommodate, which we think would be about 200 uh, hospitalizations in a day, on any day. Regarding the, the closing down by the governor, um, you know, we are being watched very closely. We, Mendocino County, every county in California is being watched very closely by the governor. Uh, the health officers get phone calls from the director of public health for the state, Dr. Angel, if there are concerns about what's happening in our counties. Um, uh, I got a, such a phone call uh, last weekend on a Saturday from Dr. Angel concerned about our social bubbles, concerned about the surge that was being seen in, in younger people. Um, we have given the message to the governor that we in Mendocino County, I as a health officer are following the governor. We are not breaking ranks with the governor. We are not questioning the governor and we are cooperating in every way with any time that the, the state asks us for reporting, we give it. And I th I'm hopeful that because we've been so cooperative and that we have done everything um, to our ability to prepare and respond. We've done everything that we've been asked to do and everything that is uh, smart and wise to do based on fact and science, that the governor would not force us to go backwards. Um, we uh, do have a watch list mechanism in the state of California where we could be put on a watch list if we increase our numbers of cases too much uh, or we overwhelm our hospital or something like this. Um, well, it comes before the overwhelming the hospital, but if there's any indicators that we might be moving in that direction, we can be put on a watch list. That has not happened for Mendocino County, but we have been put into a category where we're having to report uh, directly to the state because we have had a surge. So we don't know the answer of when the governor might come in and tell us we have to go backwards, but we're hopeful that because we've been so compliant and cooperative that we've done everything we can in our county um, that that will not happen for us. But this is a, a primary reason that my new orders coming out next week are not going to allow for further loosening of restrictions on businesses. For example, I am not going to loosen the current restrictions on lodging. The governor could see that. If I did that, the governor could look at my orders and say that I had acted unwisely and that could trigger a corrective action. And I don't wanna do anything like that. I wanna hold the line so we don't have to go backwards um, and that we can continue in the status that we're in now. Thank you, Dr. Duhan. Next up, we have Adrian Bowman with Mendo Voice. How are you doing, everybody? Good. Can you hear you. me? Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to echo some of the questions of my colleague at, at KMUD. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the, the specifics of the statistics. Do you have, uh, could you talk about our value, um, what that might be in Mendocino County, if there's a specific number for Mendocino County or if you're extrapolating from the state wide number and what that would mean in terms of a doubling, quadrupling of cases uh, and, and uh, when you would expect those, when, when you currently project those benchmarks to be reached in terms of total number of cases, not just hospitalizations. Yeah, Adrian, so if you look on that new, newly released um, data tracker for the state that I mentioned earlier, which, mm -hmm. you know, we've all been anticipating, the health officers have been anticipating this. Um, it's actually a very, very positive development. Uh, some of the greatest, you know, epidemiologists have come together to create it. It uses multiple models, not just one. Um, and using multiple models, uh, it, it comes up with projections, for example, the R, the R naught, which indicates with one person, how many people um, 
one case would spread the disease to. And we like to see a number below one. Um, we use a term called R actual, and uh, numbers greater than three are extremely alarming, three or higher, but we like it to be less than one. So what I saw is on the state website, it's called the now cast and it, it posts our actuals. And what I saw is that they've broken it down by counties, but they haven't posted our Mendocino County are not. Uh, so uh, I do expect that that will be filled out more and that all the counties will be represented. I did see that Sonoma County had an R not um, in the mid ones, so uh, higher than one. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question, but the there is a, a fundamental answer uh, that if a person who has COVID does not isolate and their contacts, their household members, their close contacts do not quarantine, that R not will be higher than one for sure. So it's only in sheltering in place, it's only in social distancing, wearing facial coverings, and that people who are in isolation quarantine follow the health officer orders that we are able to achieve an R not less than one. And I do believe, I mean, the, the, the things that the governor is tracking on, um, on this statewide data is the r not, and also the hospitalizations, number of hospitalizations per day and deaths. So in Mendocino County, um, we're very fortunate. We have nobody in the hospital at this time. We've had, a, I believe, a total of six um, uh, that have been hospitalized, all have recovered, all have returned uh, out of the hospital, done very well. We've, the hospital, I commend the hospital for the great job they've done in caring for these people. Um, and we've had no deaths. But we should not believe that we're going to be immune uh, to what other counties have experienced. You know, we should believe that at some time, as the governor's modeling suggests, we'll have 50 people in the hospital on a single day, perhaps in a month, and that we will have deaths. But we are prepared for that. Um, and we've been preparing for six months now. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know what's going to cause us to go backwards. But we know that our data is being monitored and, and my orders are being monitored. I get phone calls from the state on weekends because of my orders. We're being closely watched. Um, and so far, we've not been told we have to go backwards. Uh, thank you for that. And to, to clarify, it's now cast. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah, it's um, the now cast and there's a forecast and the now cast uh, I see. models this for the each county, the state modeling uh, is for the R actual or the R not, which shows how many people one person infected. Yeah. And the, uh, the uh, forecast is about hospitalizations. So if one person in our county uh, decided to ignore the health officer orders and all their contacts did too, they could actually perhaps make our whole county go backwards because they could create an R-naught that goes higher uh, right. and alerts the governor. So for, for my second question, I just want to give you an, an opportunity to reiterate, uh, what, is the, what is the single most important or the one or two single most important things that people can do to slow the spread? So number one is uh, follow the isolation and quarantine orders. Um, they're online. You can read them on our website. There are uh, elements of those orders that are very should be very easy to read, very uh, patient or you know, person friendly. Understand that if you test positive for COVID, you have to stay in isolation in your room with a bathroom to yourself for 10 days um, from the test date. And all of your close contacts, you need to con you need to call them and tell them they are in quarantine and these are orders. So I think that understanding that this is strict and there are not exceptions to this. Um, it, doesn't ex it doesn't give you an exception to quarantine if you go out while you're in quarantine and get a negative test. That does not release you from quarantine. Um, so understanding that, and in particular, members of the same household, we see COVID spread through households like wildfire. So, uh, we, you know, that is very, if you have a person in your household that is COVID positive, very, very important. Your whole household is on quarantine for 14 days from the date of last contact of your household member, and we can provide housing. That's number one. Number two is those basic tenets of wear a facial covering in public, stay six feet apart, uh, don't shake hands, cough into your elbow, don't spit, you know, um, and stay home when you're sick. All of these are essential, essential 
mechanisms for us slowing the spread and flattening the curve and do not have parties at your house. This is one of the things that's spreading the disease. People are having parties at their house and it is causing the surge. Uh, this is not a time to have gatherings. This is not, gatherings of any size are banned. I, by the you know what, I want to, I want to follow up on that, actually. Um, do you want to comment on the possibility of a large gathering in Willits for the 4th of July? Well, um, I'm, I'm grateful to the strong leadership in Willits that we are writing a letter to that, that those organizers saying this is a violation of the governor's ban on gatherings. And um, there is, uh, this letter will be delivered. This is a violation and very, very dangerous. Uh, gatherings of any size are banned by the governor except for protest or for worship. And worship is specifically designated to be in a, a traditional place of worship, uh, like you know a church, not saying that your venue where you hold weddings is a place of worship. It's meant to be you know, a, a recognized uh, nonprofit for the purpose of worship, like a church, synagogue, mosque, Oh, okay. Um, and so, so um, what, what would enforcement look like if people decide to violate that, that the governor's ban on gatherings? So I think we have to go on to the next questions, Adrian. Um, that is a that. very good question. And we should probably have a special conversation with the media about enforcement. But this is an that, evolving topic. Sounds good. I look forward to that. Thank you, Adrian. Next up, we have Sarah Reich with KZYX. Sarah, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I want to uh, thank you so much for having this press conference today, even though it's kind of dark news. Um, I'd like to go back to the question about immunity. We've heard so much about herd immunity, and I'm wondering if we even know anything about the way that people become immune to this virus. Like, is anybody who's recovered currently immune? Does the immunity last? And uh, being very careful about comparing this virus to the flu, but does it mutate like the flu virus so that once we get a vaccine, we could expect to need a, a new version of the vaccine every year or every six months? I mean, what, what does immunity look like to this virus? Well, it's a great question. And I want to uh, start with some gratitude for um, Adventist Health. My understanding is that they have some antibody testing uh, capability that um, we're in discussion about this being offered to the county. And as I've talked about before, antibody testing um, has limited utility for an individual to determine if they're immune and can go back to work, for example, um, and not social distance. We don't know yet enough about the disease. But what, what I want to do with this offer is to offer testing at some point, antibody testing to all of the cases that we've had in Mendocino County uh, to see if we can get information about their antibody response. Um, this would be a type of a, a research question, if you will. This is in early discussions and uh, it was a couple of a hundred of these antibody tests. And so we're, it's very early in this, but this is the type of thing that I would really um, think would be very beneficial uh, to use antibody testing for in our county, testing all those known cases that we have. Um, now, in terms of what immunity uh, provides, you know, there is a, a program being led by the state for people that have had COVID to donate their plasma, uh, which can then be given to people that are very sick in the hospital who have COVID to try and give them some protection, some, some immunity uh, through donated plasma. And this has been seeing effect positive effect, which tells us that, that people are developing antibodies that are protective um, with COVID. And, and so that is hopeful. The other thing that I think is hopeful indicator about immunity is that if we look at countries where, or, or cities like New York, where COVID broke out, uh, we did see uh, the, a peak and then a dropping in that peak, which indicates that those people who got sick didn't get sick again, you know, that they were, the virus is there, but they had some immunity. So I think there's a, there are good indicators that once someone has COVID, they have immunity against COVID, but not enough to say that somebody who has COVID doesn't have to wear a mask anymore, doesn't have to social distance anymore. Uh, regarding the vaccine, it's, it's too early to say. Um, you know, of course, we remain very, very hopeful that we'll get a vaccine. And then we reflect on HIV where we've never had a vaccine. 
So I don't think we know. But again, we just uh, continue to hold on to the slowing the spread, flattening the curve, and all of those good old fashioned uh, tools that we have, like social distancing, to keep us safe. But you, Sarah, you're asking the questions that all of the public health officers are asking on a regular basis ourselves. And uh, early indications are good, but um, we need more time to get answers, which is what slowing the curve does for us. It gives us more time. Thank you. And my next question is about some information that we got earlier this week. Um, we learned that the sewage in Willits has COVID and I'm, I imagine that means that that means there's community spread of the virus in Willits as well as the Ukiah Valley where we already know that we have community spread. And I'm wondering um, how useful that information is. Is it going to be used to inform our strategy and, and how will it change our approach as we, um, as we walk into this surge? Yes, that was very important news this week. Um, what that tells us, yes, you're right, Sarah, that, that indicates uh, community spread. Uh, what I want all of the listeners to know is you can't get infected from the sewage. It's in the sewage treatment plant and then it um, is processed. So it doesn't lead to bad water. So processing, processing of the sewage kills the virus. And we do know that the virus is shed in feces. That's been known from the beginning. We don't know how infectious that feces is, whether it's dead virus in, uh, shed in the feces, but once it's in the sewage, uh, you know, we always treat, we always uh, approach sewage with caution. Uh, and, and so we are protected from that sewage just with the systems we have in place with our safe water and the treatment kills any virus there might be. But yes, it does indicate community spread. In other words, People are using their toilets and that is accumulating in the sewage and we're seeing uh, uh, evidence of the virus there. There, I want to touch, this is, might seem tangential, but I want to touch on surveillance testing. We are committed uh, at the county to making sure that we have surveillance testing in the areas outside of Ukiah Valley. We are very grateful that we have OptumServe in Ukiah Valley because this is been allowing us to stay on top of the outbreaks, the, the number of outbreaks that we have in a, a Ukiah Valley at this time. Across the state of California, there have been uh, issues with OptumServe having delay in testing results being provided. There are reports of individuals being told of their test results before the health department is told. This is happening across the state. It's not just Mendocino County. This is an issue with OptumServe. But we still are very grateful for OptumServe because it's giving us very, very important information. The reason why this is happening with OptumServe is because we have so many cases in our state at this time. And OptumServe serves the entire state through one lab, Quest Lab, which is in San Juan Capistrano. So when we see surges, what we see is our normal systems start to break down. An example of that is lower uh, or longer times to get results. People are waiting up to a week to get the results for OptumServe. That's not because of anything the county is doing. That's because OptumServe is overwhelmed with the number of tests they're having to process now. So when we think about community spread in Willits, and when we think about surveillance testing, recognizing that we don't have a lab in Mendocino County that can process the volumes of tests that we would need every day on the order of 130 tests every day, we have to ship samples out to other labs. Those other labs are being overwhelmed. So we don't expect to get the results of surveillance tests back um, quickly because of what's happening system-wide. Therefore, when we get surveillance testing, it, what it helps us to do is track community spread. And we have to rely on individuals who are sick staying home and their contacts also staying home as a way to just make sure we limit um, infection being spread when people are sick. So unfortunately, testing is very, very complex and difficult in our state right now. And um, it makes it difficult to answer your question, Sarah, because what I'd like to say is we would do testing, uh, surveillance testing in Willits and have results back in 72 hours. And I can't say that at this time, not for any fault of the county, but for our statewide situation. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, we'll stay tuned. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Duen, do you have any final comments before we end our Friday update? 
Well, again, you know, Mendocino County, we're resilient people. Um, I, we've survived a lot together. We've survived fires and now we have a pandemic and we will get through this together. Um, please know that your individual actions are extremely powerful. They can be powerful to protect us and to keep us safe. And they can be powerful to harm us if you ignore the health officer's orders. So please uh, do follow the health officer's orders. And um, at the same time, please uh, enjoy the summer to the extent that we can. Every day is precious and we do have a beautiful community and we do have a great deal of resilience. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duhan. Thank you, Mendocino County for joining us today. We'll see you again soon.